light within my heart, light within my thoughts, light within my words. May one and all and everything, blessed and loved, ever be. Welcome. I am Sister Who. Today I just wanted to offer a few thoughts and reflections on, I suppose, uh, the questionable area of scientific limitations. Um, you know, whether things will always remain impossible or not, I don't know. Uh, but I have to wonder, and, and that's the purpose for today's show, if there isn't a certain wisdom in having certain limitations in place. In the world of uh, Star Trek, for example, they have the ability to uh, transport some person from one location to another through space. Uh, essentially converting them all into energy and then reassembling them in exactly the same configuration in another location. What that fails to deal with, I guess as you look at the, I mean on one level it's like, gee, wouldn't that be neat? And some people expect that at some point we really will be able to do that. Uh, but there's a few different concerns, not variables, but concerns about doing that. If you're going to take matter from one space and put it into another space, that space is not empty to begin with. So then the question becomes, are you basically exchanging whatever was in that space with this space so that they're both moving to opposite spaces? You know, and that, that way you've got same amount of matter in, in both places, uh, just different matter. Problem with that, of course, is whatever is standing in the spot where one is being transported to now has an easy way to invade the other space. Uh, microorganisms, uh, actual creatures, any number of things. And if the space is not computed accurately, uh, you know, is someone going to be transported and materialized inside a wall or inside of a, uh, you know, inside of some uh, space that can't support life? You know, what if, if the transporter uh, inadvertently uh, materialized someone underneath uh, the surface of the lake instead of on the shore? Uh, you know, I hope they can swim and I hope they took a deep enough breath that they don't... Um, die of suffocation before they get to the surface of the lake. Um, the other thing that science fiction uh, stories and televisions and movies rarely take into consideration, it seems, is the possibility of the immaterial, uh, the aspects of soul, uh, of spirit. If you move, if, if each of us is a fusion of body, mind, and spirit, if you move the body, can you really say that the mind and spirit travel with that? Uh, science fiction, of course, would insist that the spirit and the mind are extensions of the body. That suggests that if you could actually duplicate uh, every atom of the body, you would wind up with the same consciousness, the same spirit, uh, as what you had before the procedure. Uh, I have a difficult time buying the notion that that there is something physical that is my spirit. Because if there was something physical, then you could obviously get rid of my soul by having a surgical operation, getting rid of it and removing that part. But you know, to say that my consciousness, my spirit, my soul is nothing more than a combination of perceptions in my brain that may make it easy for a scientist, but that would leave me as a person with a whole lot of unexplainables and a whole lot of um, meaninglessness in life. And you know, from what do we derive our sense of purpose if if we are nothing more than atoms? And and yet, again and again and again throughout human history, are these uh, examples of what you might call paranormal activity that absolutely scream that there is something that is not material that is absolutely real. 
if that extends to each one of us, as I believe it does, how do we keep the multidimensionality of our of our whole selves together through a physical transportation, uh, um, yeah, transportation procedure? That uh, you know, some of my New Age and metaphysical friends will speak of there being actually like seven to nine different bodies. They have the physical body, then the etheric body, and the emotional body, and the mental body, and almost as if these things are invisible energetic envelopes around the physical body. That the physical body is simply the most dense part of a person, but that the other parts are less physical and less dense, but every bit is real. Which is why some people will speak of being able to sense each other's emotional energy. Clearly, they're not sensing uh, physical, you know, unless it's it's a minuscule faint detection of some kind of enzyme or odor or fragrance, so so subtle and so so faint, um, pheromones or something that uh, becomes that are beyond the reach of our uh, olfactory senses to detect. You know that if you can't smell it, it must not be there. Or, but then sometimes people can't smell everything from poisonous gas to uh, all sorts of of things that would be interpreted as signs of danger. Uh, or some people just simply don't have a good sense of smell. You know, mine isn't particularly acute. But um, does that? If you can't smell it, does it mean it's not there? And if it is there and we just have no way of, of detecting it, if we were to do a Star Trek transporter and move just the physical part of it somewhere else, would all the other layers of being follow? Is there something in the physical body that somehow anchors all of them, uh, such that they would get yanked through literally thousands of miles of space? Uh, I mean, there are all sorts of examples within the Star Trek television shows where people will uh, beam down, you know, uh, thousands of miles, hundreds of miles, um, at least dozens of miles, significant distances that can the non-physical parts of our cells be yanked along. It's a question I hope uh, future scientists will wrestle with quite seriously rather than dismissing uh, apathetically. Uh, but it makes me wonder if that's part of the reason why that capacity is simply not within our reach now, that that there is some sort of mysterious, transcendent, divine wisdom that understands this is where humanity is, and this is why, because of humanity being in that place, that some of the magical things we see depicted in movies and on television are not... Uh, verifiably within our reach at this point. You know, that um, that witches don't fly around on broomsticks, that uh, you can't snap your fingers and disappear from one place and reappear somewhere else, and so on. That those capacities at the level of our current level of maturity or lack thereof would open the door to dangers beyond our ability to cope. That if someone had the ability to do all those things, it would be so much power that could be so completely abused. The It's a time-honored phrase, spoken a long, long time ago, that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. In pondering that, the only power I've ever found for which that is not true is the power of love. And if if the power of love precedes all other powers, the other powers will not uh, be destructive. They will not cause any damage. If the power of love is absent, however, any power can be destructive and can create, can wreak havoc on earth, can create all sorts of evil. Another thing that we like to play around with in our literary and, and cinematic uh, imaginations is time travel. In 
there seem to be lots of people who believe that at some point we will learn how to do time travel. And I suppose that's possible. I can only pray that we have the maturity to handle the capacity when the time comes. Uh, but it does raise the question very much of whether we will be so messing with our own uh, existence, our own history at that point, that we could literally uh, unmake ourselves, um, or that it would rely upon some uh, much more complicated understanding of time and of the sequence of time than we're able to comprehend at the present time. If one can go back in time and visit oneself during crucial moments, for example, uh, if one can introduce oneself, I'm you in 20 years, you know, I'm here to tell you that, just so you know that, but of course by doing that, you may so completely alter the future that in the next moment you may cease to exist because the person who you became 20 years later was different than the person who went back in time to visit and deliver the message. So in a sense, if that were the case, then going back in time, you would have to risk, uh, it would have to be something so important that you would risk your own self-annihilation uh, that you run the risk of making a change that will prevent your so future self from existing. That there may be something that you in the past decides that leads to self-sacrifice or something so that there is no you in the future. Uh, and then we have to explain, so who was it who came back or did no one come back or did that simply never happen? Um, or, you know, if this person writes in their journal, I met my future self today, but I made a decision to do thus and so so that my future self will no longer exist. So I was visited by someone who no longer exists. Uh, it becomes a very convoluted kind of explanation, but suggests to me that maybe there is something inherent in the universe that even if we can understand certain ideas about time and about time travel, we will never be able to actually do it. And that maybe that's okay. Maybe it's actually a good thing because it would require far more maturity and understanding and respect than humanity generally demonstrates now uh, to keep that discovery from turning into uh, an unprecedented disaster. In some ways, yes, I agree, it would be wonderful and fascinating to be able to look in on past times and such, but crossing that threshold of actually doing time travel, uh, I, I suppose it's similar to the question they asked within uh, the first Jurassic Park movie, that when scientists uh, allegedly found a way to recreate dinosaurs, they didn't stop and take the time to ask whether they should. Uh, it's not an original question, though, to, and it's not a question that only was launched within modern times. Uh, we could go back to the literary classic Frankenstein, in which there is this intense examination of whether it is a wise thing for humanity to develop and to employ the capacities to actually create life. You now, in the case of the story of Frankenstein, it was bits and pieces of corpses that were put together and in, infused with mobility uh, and I suppose a certain consciousness, at least within the story. Whether that could be done in real life, I have my doubts, but it's, it's very difficult to say. And more difficult because we don't know exactly where the soul is in all of that. Uh, which was an interesting uh, question that was explored within um, the island of Dr. No, that if, if I'm remembering this correctly. It was a scientist who had created human-animal hybrids and their complaint was that they didn't have souls. Uh, that somehow they realized something was missing. Uh, but of course that uh, operates on the presumption from a human perspective, perhaps a rather arrogant one, that animals don't have souls. Uh, some of us believe they do. Um, I don't know. It's one of those things that we probably can't either prove or disprove, but, uh, but I see no reason to believe that animals can't have souls. And 
uh, certain experiences people have related to me suggest that in, in some cases the animals have even gone on to become uh, particular sorts of guardian angels, uh, you know, in, in at least a few isolated incidences. In some ways it's fun and wonderful and empowering to think so. Um, I don't know that it needs to be argued one way or the other. Uh, I usually tell people if it's helpful, hold on to it. If it's not helpful, let it go. It belongs to somebody else. The point in all of this, though, is coming to a wise and appropriate balance of humility and uh, ambition. That certain things we're willing to try, but that we don't, uh, it's kind of like the, the old saying, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. That there are challenges that need to be considered holistically and from multiple perspectives, not just by scientists, but by philosophers and theologians and sociologists uh, and all the diverse people who will ultimately have to live with the effects of whatever knowledge becomes dominant. That all of these people have a voice, have a uh, a stake in what the world will become and consequently their voices and their decisions and their preferences need to be factored in. And if the world simply isn't ready for it, uh, then you can write the notes, you can make, uh, you know, document things, you can write the theories, you can explore things around the periphery and understand that certain areas are sacred and until we have greater maturity, until we have greater um, ability to act responsibly, it's simply best not to go there. I would have suggested, had anyone asked me at the time, obviously I wasn't there, uh, that nuclear energy is one of those areas that it may have been worthy to explore theoretically, scientifically, but that ideally it should not have been explored in actuality until such time as there was a way to deal with all of the negative effects. You know, until we know what to do with radioactive waste, uh, there should not have been a, re a radioactive reactor built anywhere. Uh, Obviously, there are people on the opposite side of that argument. Uh, you know, the other problem I guess I find with a lot of the de ways that humanity has developed power, uh, you know, is, is that it has been developed without the moderation of love and consequently has become a power that corrupts and, and when it becomes an absolute power, it corrupts absolutely. You know, that if we had decided, for example, that we were not going to employ uh, energy until it could be non-polluting. You know, maybe somehow we would have resisted if it's possible. I don't know if we would have found a way around or not. Uh, we would have resisted the development of uh, anything industrial until we had perfected solar energy that was non-polluting. You know, maybe we never, maybe we never would have had uh, gasoline-powered cars. Maybe the first cars would have been electric and uh, if we had held ourselves to that kind of holistic, relational uh, patience, if you will, um, perhaps the world would be in a much better state than it is now, and we may not even be dealing with the effects of overpopulation and environmental degradation that we are. Hindsight is twenty twenty, as they say. You look back and you can see things clearly. We look forward and it's all shrouded in mist and we don't know where things are going. All I'm advocating really in the midst of all this is that we proceed with humility. We proceed with an appreciation for how uh, brilliant and inventive and beautiful we can be, but equally an appreciation for how destructive and competitive and how uh, consumerist we can be. That ultimately it's not about consuming the planet on which we live until there's nothing left. 
but it's about learning to live in balance and learning to live in a way that keeps everything cycling positively, that respects the passage of time and respects past times and doesn't try to change them from what they are, though of course as our understanding grows and as our wisdom grows to quite possibly and, and prob quite probably, hopefully even, uh, change the effect of past times upon the present. If the tragedies of the past do not have any educational uh, influence upon the present, then I think they will remain tragedies. If the tragedies of the past instead serve as effective beacons, effective warning uh, of possible dangers so that we are able to perfect our path, able to prevent future tragedies before they happen by understanding the principles that allowed the past tragedy to happen, which are again looking us in the face in the present and by looking at it this next time to recognize it and to refuse to allow the same, to, to refuse to allow history to repeat itself, to make a better choice this time so that it doesn't repeat. Uh, instead of um, cynically and fatalistically assuming that human nature will uh, always lead to the wrong, to instead consider that we have the possibility of climbing to the level of angels that that we can uh, that we can learn that we can love and that in loving all of our pursuits of power all of our pursuits of ability all our all our pursuits of expansion can be positive and nurturing ones uh, both to ourselves and to every every person and thing we encounter along the way As much as it makes sense to feel frustrated and aggravated by limitations, goodness knows I do, I have to accept that sometimes my limitations are wiser than I am, and sometimes my limitations are there because I'm simply not ready for that ability. That as much as I would love to be able to go outside my house and fly up in the air like Superman and not have to take the car anywhere I need to go, just fly there. Uh, the challenges that would bring in, the complications, the, okay, so if I can do it, why can't everyone? Or am I supposed to be more special than anyone else? Um, I don't know that I need to be more special than anyone else, but I think each of us is special in our own way. The, well, the, the movie that comes to mind is uh, The Bicentennial Man starring Robin Williams in which he was a robot pursuing full humanity. And at one point he's confronting this governing council wanting to be declared human because of, of the way he has uh, so modified himself that uh, it, the differences are, are virtually invisible, you know. And... The, one of the uh, statesmen, as I recall, instructs him that the humanity cannot tolerate a human being that does not age and die. And so it is only when uh, the protagonist demonstrates full humanity by aging and dying that he is declared fully human. As fascinating as it is, to consider that the Robert, uh, that Robin Williams' robot, uh, and named Andrew Martin, was not fully human until he aged and died. The that is only one half of the picture, and there was nothing particularly tragic about that because it was, in its own way, a gesture of success the success available to each of us is that within our limitations there is always simultaneously parts of ourselves that are beyond those limitations. There is always some music of the soul, 
some words of the spirit, some memory of the being that takes us so far beyond anything that we may, within this very small present moment, find aggravating or limiting or annoying. It is by accepting the limitations, but by treasuring the, the limitlessness, the, the lack of limitations, that I believe we find the most beautiful and truest and most complete sense of who each one of us is. If you see all the limitations, the world needs to know your spirit. If you see only your spirit, it will, the spirit needs to find expression. The spirit will remain invisible until it finds expression through the limitations. So, give thanks for your limitations and express your spirit. Thank you very much for watching.